Welcome, everyone. Uh, people are starting to filter in. I can see it already. We're up to 543. Okay, awesome. Welcome, everyone. Um, we're here today. We're talking about how to increase your sales conversion rates. And as you can see, there is no beautiful Steli FD on the line today. He had some last minute change of travel plans. So I'm stepping in for him. Um, I'm going to do my best. This isn't my personal wheelhouse, so good thing we have some serious experts here today to talk about all things increasing conversion rates. So please, um, you guys, we wanna get your questions answered too. Part of doing this webinar is to make sure that we're delivering the content that you guys personally need and are interested in getting questions answered, right? So you'll see a little Q&A tab here in the Zoom meeting. So please ask all questions using the Q&A tab. That way we'll make sure that we actually see them. And we're gonna dedicate um, about the last third of this webinar today to specifically answering your questions. So hit the Q&A as soon as you get them. Um, we're going to be answering questions in the order we receive them. And um, with that in mind, um, I want to kick this around to all of our awesome panelists here today um, to do a quick little introduction of themselves because you guys will do a much better job than I would do for you. So um, Mike, would you like to get started? Yeah, you bet. And first of all, thanks for having me. Um, I'm looking forward to, to learning from, from this awesome group of folks that you assembled here. Uh, my name is Mike Brower. I'm the VP of Sales at Full Contact. Uh, been here for the last three and a half years or so and uh, have, have ran sales organizations in the technology space now for uh, going on almost 20 years. So uh, really, really looking forward to the discussion. All right, Prayag. Uh, first of all, thank you, Ryan, for having me. Uh, my name is Triag. I'm the founder of uh, Lead Genius, and we are a data platform. Uh, we provide uh, custom data to our customers uh, and solve some of their you know, biggest pain points in lead and account data problems. Um, and we've been around for about about six years, and uh, mostly work with uh, large scale enterprises like Google, eBay, um, Facebook, etc. Colin. Hey, thanks, Ryan. Good to, uh, good to share the stage uh, with you again, Mike and Prague. Josh, good to meet you. Um, I'm Colin Stewart. I'm the co-founder, co-CEO of a book you might have heard called Predictable Revenue. I didn't write the book. I started a company here in Vancouver, BC about six years ago based on Aaron's book. Then I became his internet stalker. And then after a while, he's like, let's just merge. It just makes more sense. It'll get you off my back. Um, so I spent my whole life in sales, uh, starting, you know, when I was a kid in retail, um, and then moving into a professional, you know, B2B sales when I was 18, sold everything from, uh, accessibility lifts to diesel generators, to mines, data centers, um, commercial, uh, kitchens, uh, commercial residential kitchens to high rises. And now for the last six years, you know, I've been helping companies, basically grow their outbound or grow their companies using outbound sales, you know, whether our team is doing that for them or whether we're helping you build that team. Hey Colin, what was your original company called before you merged with? We were, we were so it started off as voltage CRM. Don't look it up. It was terrible. I sold generators and so voltage, you know, and, and you're going to love the, you're going to love the creativity on this next one. The next company was called carb.io. So I went from voltage to carburetor. Well, it was originally carburetor but we could only get carb.io. So, you know, carburetor sits on top of the engine, feeds fuel and air to combustion yeah. chambers and all that. Nobody got that. And in the, in the history of the company, I think there was maybe like three people that are like, oh, that's really clever. I'm like, yes. <laughs> all right, Josh. Uh, I'm Josh Pickford, uh, founder of Bear Metrics, is a revenue analytics platform, and I'm the least qualified person here. So I look forward to, <laughs> to contributing my lack of knowledge. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, so we're here today, um, as you know, as we said, uh, talking about how to increase your sales conversion rates, right? So there are a lot of different components to this equation in my mind. Um, better prospecting so they know you're bringing in the right leads in the first place, um, arming yourself with the right research and data, dealing with objections, having the right follow-up strategy, asking for the close, all of these things uh, we want to dig into today. But to kick this kind of uh, conversation off at the beginning, I'd like to hear from each of you guys on this one, um, regardless of whether a lead comes in from inbound or outbound efforts. Um, how do you accurately score marketing leads or begin to measure their purchase intent? 
So whoever wants to take a first crack at this, please go for it. Well, I'll, <clears throat> I'll start by telling you uh, that I believe lead scoring is, is very important. I also believe um, getting it right is, is critical. Uh, depending on who your target prospects are is going to wildly dictate how you do that lead scoring. So as an example, um, I worked at a company previously where uh, we sold to, uh, we knew exactly who we were selling to. It was a um, uh, external financial reporting managers of public companies. So in the lead scoring process, if an inbound lead came in and that was their title, we put a ton of weight or, or score on that being the right title. Uh, in, in other uh, engagements, depending on who you're going after in the market, uh, the size of company may be important. The seniority of that individual may be important. Um, how they engaged with you through the marketing funnel may be uh, a critical if they downloaded one piece of content versus another. So uh, getting that dialed in and getting that right is, is, is tricky and it's, it's uh, the, the, the key to having that, that top of funnel work for you. Can I, can I build on what Mike is saying? Because I, I, I'm a big fan of lead scoring when you need it. Right. If you look at full contact, if you look at barometrics, you look at lead genius, how, like what's your average volume of, uh, of leads coming in inbound to you right now? R rough estimate. Are we talking hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, Mike? Yeah. On our end, it's, it's call it uh, hundreds on a weekly basis. Yeah. Uh, how about Josh? What about you? Same. Prague. So, I mean, Colin, that's, I think the question probably isn't how many leads are you getting the question is how many leads are you getting that you really want to work right it's, true it's the, <laughs> but I mean, I, we, we are in in the hundreds but as i said like a lot of our customers come from uh, um, most successful customers customers are big hefty enterprises and you know you don't i mean we still get a lot of inbound from them but you don't rely on inbound to go after you know the, the ibms of the world or the googles of the world Right. hundred percent. I, the only reason I was asking was just to provide a little context. I see a lot of companies that are getting 10, 20, 30 a week. And they're saying, Oh, should we, should we invest in Marketo, Eloqua, Pardot, whatever you name it. Um, and, and spend 30 grand on a solution to do all this lead scoring. And the answer is probably at that size, that at that volume, no, but the volume you guys are doing, you know, yeah. If you get the, if you have the teams to do it, or if you don't have the, the resources to cover all of that, and if you can get a multiple out of, an, out of a purchase like that, then I think it's a great idea. But I think I've seen a lot of people jumping to spend 30, 40 grand. It's like, you only, you only get 30 leads a week. Like you can have one person easily follow up on all of those, no problem, and just yeah. score them manually. I, so again, also jumping off of what Mike said here, um, where every company will differ on what the, those sort of things that would go into a lead score. But I think for a lot of companies or people who haven't done any sort of real qualifying on an inbound lead, the idea of scoring something in and of itself might even be too complex to get started. And instead you could take like a couple of those things, those sort of qualifiers, like maybe you see like if anything comes from say a free email address, like if it's a, at Gmail or at Hotmail, like that's probably, like the chances of that being a business is lower or like, um, you know, their title, CEO versus CFO versus VP versus whatever, like pick one of those things that you think is a major qualifier and then just go off that instead of like trying to build up an algorithm or use something and adjust all the levers to tweak the score, like start simple and then you can kind of build on top of that. So, so building on what Josh said, so, I'm a, uh, my background is actually in computer science. I, I kind of stumbled into uh, marketing tech. Um, so I like to think about things from the first principle, right? So from the first principle, the ideal scenario is if you want to close 100 deals a month to get to, uh, to your target uh, revenue, 100 leads are the ideal. 100% conversion rate from start to finish, right? That's the ideal world. So for me, my, I mean, everything that I decide from sales and marketing, going through, every, every advice I give is, can we drive towards that? I and mean, obviously that's an ideal scenario, right? So looking at it from, uh, from that world, right, the, the, the lead scoring becomes this 
in, in some way, the lead scoring becomes this idea of lead filtering, right? Like, can we filter out every other lead except the 100 that are going to close, right? So, um, so and, and in my opinion, especially coming from a mar marketing tech world, um, I think, um, and, and if, if kind of the analogy of that is, if you need 100 deals to close, um, then could you get to a place where the 100 leads that you have are all the leads that your sales team is excited to be working on, right? Because if you're, um, from, from marketing point of view, you're always talking about conversion rates and so on and so forth. But in the end, somebody needs to do that selling and that seller knows in their heart if they have enough experience. And Mike, you can, you can, you, if you can back me on that, like a salesperson was, you know, good experience would know which lead is more likely to close. So for me, kind of the idea around lead scoring comes back to, um, can we replicate a salesperson's thinking when they look at a lead? Can we get them the leads that they get excited about? Everything else is just, you know, everything else is nothing. It doesn't matter. In the end, if you can get that salesperson, get like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm, I'm, I'm talking to this person. Like everything should be driven from that point of view. And, you know, no software could come get you there hundred um, percent. But, you know, that's the paradigm from which I, I try to drive my thinking. I like that a lot. So you guys, um, I, I want to keep this moving forward and, and kind of the logical progression here, right? Mm -hmm. So getting your prospecting right to me is, is, is what I feel comes naturally next. So speaking specifically to outbound prospecting here, which I know a couple of you have a lot of experience with. Um, let's say you have a team of SDRs that have been bringing in a high volume of low quality leads um, for your sales team to close. And as a result, your sales team is wasting a lot of time on leads that aren't actually a good fit to buy. I feel like this is a very common situation for startups as they begin to scale. So, What's your first step when you're in this situation and, and starting to turn things around and evaluate how your SDRs can better qualify prospects earlier on in the process? Yeah, I would, I would start that with, um, it's all about having the data and, and, and down to the individual SDR. So you, if, if you find that, uh, and you start looking at conversion rates through the funnel, so you have an outbound prospecting effort uh, you see that uh, one SDR is, is booking 30 meetings a month and 22 of those 30 meetings are converting into pipeline and, and a third of that pipeline turns into revenue. You have another SDR that's booking 40 meetings a month, uh, but only f uh, seven of those meetings are turning in the pipeline and three are turning into revenue. Uh, you really have to be able to dig into the data to understand what the difference is. And many times in my experience, the, the easy answer is, well, BDR uh, or SDR1 is more effective than SDR2. Uh, but if you really look at the data, many times you find it's, it's that you have an SDR who's targeting the right people, the right companies, the right personas. You have another SDR that, that is targeting a, a completely different list. And, and, uh, and, and, and so doing that coaching of, hey, keep putting in the same effort, but do it towards this more effective uh, persona or this more effective list, uh, that a lot of times uh, becomes the answer. Mike, I'll actually kind of, I, I mean, I wouldn't disagree, but I would kind of turn the table around. I don't think this is an SDR problem. I think this is a, this is a marketing functions problem. I, if your SDRs are widely differing in the type of customers that they are, they're bringing in, then their market, the market profile of, uh, or the segment that you're going after has not been clearly defined, right? Um, ideally, again, you know, from the first principle, every single SDR would be bringing in absolutely the right kind of deal that everyone in, in, the, in, in the sales organization is trying to work, right? So I think the, the problem comes from, I think the marketing function has become too much about automation too much about volume and too little about really grokking and understanding who your customer is. I think if you ask me in a random survey of like 
hundred marketing people and, and, and ask them who exactly is your customer. I don't think today, like 50% of the marketers would be able to absolutely crystal clear define who their customer, and, and I would actually say that the, the problem is because the automation tools have become so much easier, you know, there's, it's, it's easy to send out massive amount of emails by SDRs and, and see what sticks. Right now it's a game of chance. Now somebody takes a chance and one SDR is taking a chance with one list, gets a lot of success. The other, other SDR doesn't, but that's not how you build a predictable revenue pipeline. Right? So I think if your SDRs are not performing, do not look at the SDR function. Look at your marketing function. Look at your leadership. Are you, do you absolutely know in your heart, what are the five really precise customer profiles that, and, and, and those profile goes beyond just revenue or size. Like it has to be like, you know, why are they buying? And I mean, that's kind of generally the theme of advice. And I think you see this coming a lot in when I talk about things, but you need to really grok why your customers are buying, who they are to really, really understand why SDRs are not performing. I don't think mm-hmm. it's an SDR, SDR problem at all. I think it's a range, right? When you look at what Mike is saying, you look at the inputs, you look at the outputs, right? I think what Prayag is, Prayag, sorry, I think I'm saying your name wrong. So, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Okay. You're, you're speaking, you're saying it better than when my wife <laughs> when, I, when I first met her. <laughs> this is a whole different conversation. I'm not going to scream your name. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I like what you're saying about, you know, you're sort of alluding to that what, what we ask of our SDRs a lot of the time is, hey, go find some customers, right? Go build this list. When that, that dis- you're, you're asking them to make a thousand decisions, maybe not a thousand, let's say 50, 100 decisions a day of, is this customer a good fit? And I find, I think a lot of the times is one, the SDR isn't the right person in the organization to say, hey, this company's a great fit or not. You can train them a lot, you know, and you can give them target markets, you can give them access to the data. But I think at the end of the day, leadership in general, whether it's sales, marketing, the CEO, product, whoever it is, somebody's got to own these are our segments. This is, and all the way down from, you know, not just the fluffy, you know, these are the marketing personas. Those are great and those are super helpful. Coming from a sales background, those don't help me at all translate this into a list of companies. And so I feel like leadership, no matter who it is, you got to help that SDR narrow, narrow down that exact list of these are the, this is our total addressable market. This is our entire world. Okay, now that we've got you focused on, on the companies that we know are great fits or are likely to be great fits, you eliminate that whole element of, are they reaching out to the wrong people, right? Or if you've got a ton of great SDRs and they're reaching out to that list, is our hypothesis about this list incorrect, right? And you, it's all about sort of eliminating one variable at a time. And so you can sort of take a bit of a scientific approach. And, and once you do that, I don't think SDR should be doing any lead generation. I think SDR should be given a list from the organization and they should be working the list. SDR, if they're doing personal research, they're they doing research, they're wasting their time. So, so once you have what done, what Colin said, like you do not, you eliminate SDR research process completely. I, I like, I, I think I agree with you most of the time, but if you're, if you're only prospecting to 10 accounts, if I'm only prospecting to 10 accounts, I'm going to do all that research because I'm going to go, there's, there's, certain, there's a certain level of research that only I can get to, a certain level of understanding that only myself as the, as the SDR or as the account executive, you know, and, and if you're only hunting 10 very, very large accounts, you know, sure, you could do it faster, you could do it more efficiently, but that's not what we're pushing towards. We're pushing towards the quality metric in that case. So yes, for a lot, you know, you're 100% right for like 90% of the cases, but that like top 10% where those clients are worth 10 times more than everybody else in the bottom 90, then, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think, yes, if you have to get data by making a phone call, you have to like figure out, you know, uh, who is connected, like, you know, if you have to figure out some really complicated um, problems that can only be resolved by calling your friend in the company, then yes, that's an SDR function. Um, but I don't, I don't, that I don't categorize that as research or lead generation. Mm-hmm. Well, guys, well, I want to flip this. I want to flip this question um, now, kind of on its head, um, and, and go in a direction that I know Josh in particular can really weigh in on here. And Colin, you guys too. Um, so shifting over a little bit more to 
um, you know, the inbound lead generation side of things. So you guys have doubled down really well on content marketing as a channel for bringing in like a high volume of traffic and thus inbound marketing leads, right? So you're not doing the outreach yourselves. You're kind of relying on the right people to find you, to find your content. So in that context, how do you guys make sure that your inbound efforts are actually bringing in high quality people and not just a ton of, you know, window shoppers? Josh, why don't we tee you up for this one first? We just sort of all jump in and dominate the conversation. <laughs> it, was, it was fascinating because that's not my world. Um, so on the, on the inbound side of things, we've tried so many um, different types of content. Like content's a massive portion of our inbound effort. Um, and so it comes down to like what kinds of content are we producing? And um, I think for us, it's like we'll get – we kind of get these fluctuations that almost match the type of content that we produce um, as far as the quality of the lead. So uh, say I write something about like us almost running out of money. So that speaks, that speaks um, directly to the CEO, CFO kind of people who are like just freaking out about money all the time. And those also happen to be pretty good customers for us. So great set of new customers come in from that. Now, we write something else about like, um, like ad retargeting or something like that. Like most of our, um, the user base for us, uh, or the type of customer, the person that would use the dashboard that we produce. Um, so they're interested in advertising and bringing in new customers that way, but like they're not, they won't get a lot of use from bare metrics. So um, they, they like, will get a ton of, signups, but then like they don't even have access to the type of data that we need to give them a report. So, um, so we've spent a lot of time basically like chiseling down what's a really good piece of content or who is going to read the thing um, to figure out how can we uh, influence the type of leads and the quality of leads that come in from that. And that's, that's awesome, Josh. There's so much that, that you can do at the top of the funnel to make sure that you're, you're being smart and intelligent and measuring what's happening. One, like, I can't, I'm not, not our marketing function, so I, I can't speak for on behalf of Mina. Um, but I can say one thing that we've done as a team is sort of worked to integrate our sales and marketing team. We all sit on, on the revenue team. We all roll up under, under myself as sort of the rev team lead. Um, and that's, you know, our VP of sales, VP of marketing, SDR team, AE team, inbound team, everybody, they all roll up under one umbrella and they all sit together. So they're all intermingled and mixed. It's not this like clear physical divide. And I think what that's, what that's created is this sort of crosstalk between teams, right? We had this promotion going out last month where we were giving away a free course, right? And everybody knows when you give away something for free, you know, you're going to see a high volume, but the quality is not going to be there, right? And we actually, just, just from having our team sort of sitting next to each other, we all agreed that, yes, this was the case, but we actually found a couple of segments that looking at the data, there's not a statistically significant, you know, sample there, that you wouldn't have picked up on, but just having the team sitting there talking and saying, oh, actually, if we could just change this one piece of targeting so that this, this particular segment is not, you know, we're, we're moving money away from this segment and we're doubling down on this piece. Um, what we actually saw quite a bit of a, we saw quite a lift out of that. And that was, you know, our, our inbound guy sitting next to the VP marketing going, hey, these are good, but can we make these little tweaks? That's smart, I like that. So guys, um, I wanna jump sort of uh, topics right now and, and go to some of the questions we got from people in the lead up to the webinar. Um, so a really frequently asked one that I saw come through um, over the past few days, how do you negotiate with a prospect when they're evaluating competitors? So they could be coming at you on something like pricing or missing features uh, or otherwise really. So how do you approach these kinds of conversations? Yeah, my feeling in negotiating is if you really understand through the process what goal, need, or issue the prospect has, and you've been able to prove the value of your solution or offering in order to help them meet that goal, need, or issue, uh, then when it comes to price negotiation, the, the, and the response is the price is the price. So if, if they continue, if you're going to get shot based on price to your competitor, then 
you have done nothing to, to show that you understand their problem and you provide more value to them than what a competitor can. Uh, so if you've done your job through the sales process uh, and through the evaluation process, then the negotiation part is, is pretty easy uh, or at least should be. Yeah. I also think you're kind of teeing yourself up for that to always be a sticking point as they need to like expand. It will always be this really frustrating point if you make it about price from the beginning. Yeah. I, I think real salespeople close on value, not on price. Right. If you, if you're having, especially, you know, we're talking deals that are 10 K to hundred K every year. Um, you're looking at building some real value. You're looking at, you know, actually creating something in this company, in this organization, you're helping them achieve something. And that's the goal of this sales process is to really narrow down on what am I going to help you achieve? What am I going to help you unlock? And ideally your product supports you in a way that you're uniquely positioned, right? And your whole sales process is geared to walk the customer through and help them understand why we're uniquely positioned to solve that pain. If you're, if you're doing that, you know, price is the price, right? That's I, what, I agree. Yeah. We're talking about value here. Yeah, I, I agree with the panelists here. I, if you are, if your salespeople are talking about price, and if that's the sticking point that comes up again and again, if that's the value, you're slightly cheaper, and you better run, because that the end is coming at you really quickly. And right, because if yeah. if you start off the relationship that way, right? Oh, you 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 made it cheaper. You added more value by making it cheaper. The only way you can add more value is by continuing to make it cheaper. Right. It's I, mean, I think there is, there is a market there, but I, I don't think, you know, uh, I, if, if your salespeople are talking about pricing at any point, not just at the beginning, at any point during the process and comparing you with your competitors, you have not done a good job at differentiating yourself. Um, even in the most crowded markets, you can differentiate yourself. And if you're sticking in pricing again and again, it, it, you know, it will come up. But if this is a sticking point, and especially if they're comparing you with your competitors, you haven't you haven't done a done a great job. It's either a sales problem or, uh, again, coming back to the customer profile problem. If you're going after the right customers, selling the right value, they could never be compared apples to apples to you to your competitors. I think it's a, you're absolutely right. What you just said there, it's a signal that you haven't done your job selling, right? Because if you're if you've truly done your job, there's no comparison, and they would understand that. Whereas if they're sitting looking at their, your competitor's pricing table, you obviously haven't gotten deep enough. You haven't shown them, you know, here's the value that we can create for your organization, right? If they're looking at, oh, well, I get 99 units on this one. Well, you only give me 60. Like that's, that's not a partnering conversation. That's yeah, a, it, trying to grind you down here. It could be the sales or it could be, again, the leadership, right? Like, do you absolutely know why your customers are buying from you? They're buying from you because you're cheaper. Yeah, not the market you want to be in, at least. Right. <laughs> so, guys, yeah. we've got another frequently asked question here. Um, this one I know will actually be extremely relevant to the people watching today that are trying to sell into larger organizations. So, how do you deal with the situation where you feel like you're close to finalizing a deal and you learn about a new stakeholder or a new <laughs> manager that you have to kind of involve in the purchasing decision or at least get some sign off with? How do you keep a deal like that from getting derailed. I want to hear Mike uh, jump in on this one because the last time I checked, Mike forecasts all his quarters within 1% revenue. Are you still doing that, Mike? <laughs> um, well, well, we have it down to about a half a percent, but you know, That's we're not going to argue over a half percent. It's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, listen, the, the, um, if, if you have done, your job in the sales process. And, and I would contend uh, for anybody out there, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, uh, there's a couple of tools from something called customer centric selling as an example that I love to leverage. And this will tie into the question. So if you're writing and documenting uh, what we refer to as a champion letter, uh, that, that starts in the discovery phase of, of an engagement with a large enterprise. And that is a working document throughout the sales process. It is very easy if at this point now you've documented what the goal, need, or issue in depth of what they're trying to solve, how your solution solves it, what the ROI is on that. Now when the new stakeholder comes involved, the first thing you do is get on a call and you say, hey, would love to catch you up to speed here. Let me send this over to you. Um, because the business, it ultimately becomes the business case. 
Now, if you've been single threaded in an enterprise and now at the tail end of the process, they're bringing in another stakeholder or two or three that you need to go resell the value to, then I would contend you weren't even close to the end of that process. You weren't as far along as what you thought you were. And uh, I uh, totally agree with you, Mike. So we sell a lot to enterprises. That's kind of a, a large part of our business. And what I like to do is if I'm involved in a deal, I would go to my champion and say, who in the organization do you think can derail this deal? Right? Like we're close enough. Are there people that are going to come in and say, why are we doing this? And if there are, like, let's get in touch, like get us introductions to those, to those people. Um, that, and that has helped. And if this happens, you, you, even in, with the best of salespeople, this would happen. Like somebody would pop up in a large organization. Um, but ideally, you should get it, get to them first before they get to you. 100%. It, it's about, as a salesperson, it's about doing your homework, right? Ahead of time, you should know going into any organization who is likely to be involved. If not the exact title, the, the, you know, the rough sort of buyer, right? Of who, who do we typically see? And if you think you are 90% of the way through and you haven't met 75% of the buyers that you typically talk to, you're not where you think you are. <laughs> yeah, the problem is it's not, you know, you, it's not a, you know, how it's not, it's hundred percent or zero, right? Like, because one, one buyer can derail the entire six, seven figure deal. So, so it becomes really hard. I mean, it, I mean, as much as I agree with you, Colin, but like, you get, you know, as sales, salespeople, you get, you get, uh, you get surprised constantly. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it's not, it's hard to avoid that. I think Josh, you become, Josh, I was just gonna, gonna, uh, go ahead, Mike. Well, I was just going to say you, you become more proactive in searching out who the other, uh, uh, key stakeholders, the influencers and so on. The more battle scars you get as a salesperson from losing the deal, <laughs> you're single threaded, or forecasting the big deal to your boss, you know, for the for the end of Q4, and you tell the CFO you can take it to the bank, and then that deal, of course, pushes. Um, once you build up those scars, you start to become more proactive in the process. It's the scar hey, tissue that makes down. you wise. That's yeah. right. <laughs> this in a microcosm is the problem of enterprise sales. Like this exactly it. <laughs> So Every Josh, problem comes from this problem. Josh, I want to shift gears because I've got one of these questions that came in before the webinar that was specifically uh, directed to you on this one. Um, so Bear Metrics is largely a self-serve product from the standpoint of people upgrading from being a lead or a trial into becoming a paying customer. So have you guys conducted any sorts of experiments over the past few years on your email sequences or like in-app touch points um, that have had a direct impact on conversion rates? Yes. So the less that we automate, the better. So anytime that we've tried to be like, let's, let's uh, send a couple of things about like how to get more value out of the software, but would you have to generalize what value a given customer is even going to get or a given lead? Um, so the more like that I can just start, uh, I mean, lob a, hey, thanks for trying this out. Tell me about your business kind of email from me. Um, that works exponentially better for getting me or a salesperson a call or a demo. Um, yeah, I mean, we are very self-serve. Um, you get past a certain point and we stop um, trying for it to be self-serve and try to do like a typical sales process. Um, but yeah, the more that we try to like automate any of that stuff, the more it just kind of will look back and be like, man, the conversion rate on this stuff was terrible during that time compared to when we try to be more manual and like personalize some stuff. Like even if it's just like a, Hey, thanks for signing up. You know, you can keep upgrading or do whatever you want. Um, but we're big fans of what you're doing. Like I'll go check out their website and like do four minutes of work to go figure out just a little bit about them. So that's obvious. We're not just automating it. Um, but that, yeah, you guys use the, company revenue as kind of a proxy for deciding whether or not to, to lump them into a more general sales process? Yeah. So we've got, uh, that's a big benefit of us is that, or of our platform is like, we know how much money you're making. So you don't, it's not like you select some range. Like I know exactly how much you're making. I know how much your customers are paying you. Uh, you know, I know how many customers you have, all sorts of stuff. That's really great for putting you in a certain bucket. So I know how to, you know, spend time helping so josh oh, yeah. uh, does that mean that you're going more into uh kind of a high touch model 
for higher paying customers than yes. you were in the past? Okay. Absolutely. So, you know, if you're on, if you're, if, if you're a new company making a thousand bucks a month, like you're going to stay on the automated mm -hmm. thing. But if you're doing a million dollars a month, then like I'm, I'm going to work pretty hard to try to get a call with you, you know? And so it, it helps us um, know who to really spend time on and not have to just give everybody the same amount of attention, um, which is, that's helpful. Yeah. Comes back to prioritization. Yeah. So Mike, I want to kick this one over to you. Um, uh, I want to get your take on this because uh, you're still pretty close to, to working with individual salespeople quite a lot, or at least overseeing some of their work. So during your training process for new reps, do you have any specific closing techniques that you guys teach or like to reinforce and to tack a little secondary onto that one? How do you make sure as a manager that your reps are actually consistently using and implementing what they're taught? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so a, a couple of pieces. First of all, from a closing technique perspective, uh, we certainly teach uh, leveraging uh, this, this living document throughout the sales process. Um, when, it comes to, when it comes to the time to deliver the price, we, we have, a, 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 number one, we'll role play that, right? And, and, and we'll say, okay, here's the reaction. At, I think any salesperson knows it's really that you quote the price and then their, their response is, oh, that's great. That's far less than what I thought it was going to be. Thank you. You know, and um, so, so we role play the, 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 um, the uh, reaction and how that conversation is going to go. The other thing is we go into it in particular for larger enterprise deals and we build out uh, the, the, what are the things we're willing to give and then what are we, what's the S to get in return? And so of course on that list, it's not about taking the price from 100,000 down to 90,000. It's, hey, we're willing to give you, uh, you know, five hours of professional services uh, included if in return, you're willing to do a case study for us, right? So, so we literally write that out. Yeah, yeah. So that way when you go into the call, um, you're not thinking on your feet and, and just trying to, um, just trying to think, boy, what do I have to give away here to get the deal signed? Instead, it's, it's been planned out what you're willing to negotiate or not and understand if you've done your job and built the value, then it's okay on that call to walk away. Uh, now, how do we enforce that? Uh, we, we do pretty rigorous pipeline reviews um, as well as one-on-ones with the, with the uh, sales professionals. Um, and that's where we get into the weeds around each individual deal and what's happening on it, what the next step is, and, and how we're approaching it. Colin, I know this is something you guys have done a lot of uh, training on and a lot of writing about. Do you want to weigh in on this topic? I mean, when it comes down to it, like uh, Mike's, Mike's covered all the bases, right? You, you, you document everything ahead of time. You sit, to, you sit with them on a regular basis and you review their pipeline. Um, and you, you do one-on-one -on -one coaching to make sure that, you know, the follow-up is there, right? You know, we like to work on individual coaching plans with each of the reps. Um, I personally like to have every, uh, to know the, the metrics of each rep, um, but I also like to let them drive the content of those one-on-ones. Pipeline is one thing, you know, we're sitting down, we're actually having a conversation about this and you're going to learn quite a bit about where their strengths, where their weaknesses are, where they're comfortable, where they're not comfortable right in that pipeline review, you're going to start to see things. You'll feel it. You know, they're going to feel it. And then I let them drive the, the content of the one-on-ones. You know, I might steer it here or there say, Hey, I noticed this, you know, I noticed that, but generally I want to let them come to me with, here's what I want to work on today. Here's where I feel like the biggest gap is. And I feel like our role as sales leaders is to sort of, is, is not just to sit and tell and say, Hey, I saw you do this and this sucked and you need to improve this and this, right? Like I used to coach hockey that way. It did not work at all. <laughs> it's like, and in hockey, you can shoot pucks at them if they don't listen. So like you can't do that in the office. People get very, very mad. HR gets involved. I don't have a job anymore. So you have to let them sort of drive the agenda. Right. And I, I found it much more powerful, you know, whether it's hockey or whether it's coaching SDRs or AEs is if they have that drive, if they have that desire, that interest in, Hey, this is where I feel like the biggest improvement or the biggest um, thing that I'm struggling with this week right? Everybody's got that. And so if I'm coming and I'm bringing my agenda and I'm saying, okay, here's the four things, five things that we need to talk about. They're sitting there the whole time thinking, well, there's the one thing that I want answered. Why aren't we talking about that? And they're just sitting there sort of 
not engaging half of their brain because they're waiting to get their one question answered. And so I find letting them drive the agenda lets me do the best job of actually helping them on a weekly basis in those one-on-ones, finding out where they feel like they're struggling. And it, it could be, you know, hey, you're not actually struggling at that. You're just not, not super confident in your abilities. Let's do a little to build you up. Let me show you why you're actually better than you think you are at this one thing. And then once you've sort of, once you've answered their questions, once you've sort of helped them with what they want to work on, now you've got the opportunity to, they're open. They're like, oh, that was really helpful. I've solved my thing. Now you can jump in and say, hey, you know, I noticed that you weren't following this thing. You know, it's, you know, typically it's a bunch of little tiny minor things that just need tiny little course corrections. And and that's all. So, So Ryan, do you mean, like, are you talking about enforcement of a sales process or sales training? Because I feel they're both related, but kind of separate things, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, when you look at the sales, sales process, it, it's got to be really well documented, right? And if you see people misusing stages or if they've got, you know, and Mike's the expert here, but, you know, if they're in the, um, they're not filling out their, their med pick or I can't, Mike, I can't remember the model you used. I, I'm pretty sure it wasn't med pick, but if they're not filling out, you know, those particular criteria, you know, that's coming up in pipeline, right? Cause you're going to see that. And that's sort of the, the process enforcement. Whereas I, the, that's how I see it. Whereas the one-on-ones are a little bit more in the coaching, trying to add value, yep. right? It, it's not a disciplinary thing. You know, this is something that, I'm, I get an hour a week with, with each of the reps and I'm trying to, I want to get them fired up and ready. And I'm trying to right. use that time to make them just 1% better every week, you know, and right. how, however that's going to be, whether it's something they, they feel like they need to do, whether it's something that, that I need to do or whether it's just, Hey, you know what, this week we're all good. I'm going to just put an extra hour on your calendar so that you can get your job done. Right. So guys, I want to kick over to uh, some of the questions that people have been asking here. We've gotten quite a few already. Um, so we're going to try and get through as many as we can. If you guys still have questions, please ask them using the Q&A tab here in the webinar window. Um, so this one is coming from Pablo. This is a really good question. Um, we're, pr- we're planning to create a light version of our software for SMBs. We've been selling to big companies for over 20 years, but the sales process is a nightmare. Any advice for this migration, how do you shift from selling <laughs> the big companies over to a selling to SMBs? So there is a there is a tweet by Jason Lemkin, which says, "Going up market for a company is really freaking hard. Going down going down market is impossible." Which you know, <laughs> sorry, Pablo. I mean, I, I think that's interesting. Uh, that's probably accurate. It's probably accurate. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to go down market. The pro- it's a different beast completely. Like it's not just you. I don't think the product is the only thing. Like product is just one small part, because now you have to build muscles like building inbounds, right? Like automate, automatic, and work. like you can't spend a lot of time. The problem is when companies go down market, down market, they are able to close. The problem is that their LTV to CAC ratio go like through the floor because they keep spending the same amount of time. On, this, on the customers that they were doing when they were kind of more enterprisey, And, you know, it's like, oh, revenue is coming in. But when you do LTV to CAC analysis, you find out that like it's 0.8 when it was like, you know, 7.8 before. So um, it's it's like sales is just, oh, sorry, product is just a small part. You have to start from scratch. The entire process needs to be built from scratch, from customer profile to all the way to like every step of the funnel. Um, needs to be needs to be the top. You're, all the, you're all the difference. building separate companies. Go ahead, Josh. Like, yeah. Yes. You're, it's like it's not even like oh, let's build a, a slightly different version of the. You might as well start a new company. Like they're just <laughs> totally separate things. You know. You, and I think that you, if you start blurring the lines, then you'll get frustrated at yourself because like why it's not working? We this should be easy, and now you're you know. Entirely. Because because it feels easy, right? Hey, we can close these really big deals. Right. What if we just had a $49 or $99 a month product that we didn't have to do all this work? Well, you don't have to do that work, but you need to do a whole different set of work to, like like Prague said, build out that muscle. And just like Josh, it's a, Josh said, it's a brand new company that you're creating, right? And I think that we can't miss that point is that all, all of these pieces that you need are totally different and you're going to need different people because if you're trying to take somebody who's used to supporting an enterprise customer that's worth a hundred grand a year and you put them on somebody that's now worth $1,200 a year, they're, they're going to have a real tough time going from being a great customer advocate to being like, you know what, 
if I spend more than five minutes with you, this is not profitable for the company. They're not going to be able to do it. So you need a whole different team. Yeah, I, I would Hit the reset button. Yeah. Yeah, Pablo, would. be think very carefully if you really want to do this and start from <laughs> scratch. <laughs> All right, guys, the next question, um, we, we've got it in a couple of different forms. Um, so I'm going to kind of consolidate it here. So can you guys speak to your own personal mix of prospecting channels that you use? Or, you know, maybe more specifically, what is the most effective um, lead generation channel for you guys currently? Lead genius, we're hands down. I send, I send homing pigeons. <laughs> uh, and we should add, you know, maybe getting more specific, speaking to B2B companies here. Yeah, yell, so, I yell a lot and just scream. Yeah. Into the show. Scream into the void until somebody right. listens to you. <laughs> <laughs> right, Josh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we, for ourselves, and we work, we see a lot of teams that, that do, you know, inbound and outbound. I don't think anybody's going to deny, deny that outbound is still probably, or sorry, outbound using email is still one of the, the largest channels. Um, if you look at the total, vo total volume of, of deals that, that come that are touched by or initiated by email, that doesn't mean that cold calling is dead. It doesn't mean you shouldn't cold call. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do ads. It sh doesn't mean you shouldn't do content or inbound or any of that. It just means that and when you look at everything, I think the, when you look at the companies that are really succeeding, that are really rolling with it, everybody's using email. Right. And Colin, have you seen the effectiveness of email drop in the past six years? Seven if, you, years? if you're still trying to use the, the templates that, you know, Aaron talked about in the book. Um, absolutely. You know, it's, you, you look at what's happened with, you know, all the different software tools that make it easier and easier and easier to send, a hundred emails a day plus a hundred follow-ups, right? The email volume in everybody's inbox I know has increased. And it's not just, you know, the marketing automation tools, it's the sales enablement sales automation tools. So when the volume picks up, you know, it forces us all to be better. Right. And I, t I totally blame Aaron for like the death. Of <laughs> you made it sound so easy. Everybody's doing it. Well, it's not the death of email, but you know, you got people that, that have just read the book a couple of weeks ago. They're trying, you know, the base level templates. Those worked wonderfully six years ago, but you got to up your game now if you want to get the same response rates. Yeah, I feel like the threshold of value has just continued to rise and rise. And See, I think on the counterpart, the cold calling, as Colin said, like cold calling has, uh, cold calling is, <clears throat> uh, cold calling, uh, cold calling is a really- It's, it's my um, new porn name. <laughs> <laughs> is a really, uh, un, uh, you know, especially startups don't look at it. Um, and you can just like dial through, but like if you start building uh, infrastructure for that, you'll do a lot of things right. Cause it's expensive to cold call. You are not going to start cold calling, you know, down the yellow pages, which a lot of like emails, that's what a lot of people do. Yeah. Don't, yeah. don't hand your reps the, the phone book and a phone yeah. and say, go. go. Yeah. <laughs> Another question we got in here today in many different forms actually is, is related to following up. So let's say you, you are very convinced that the, the lead you're following up with, whether they came from outbound or inbound um, is qualified. They're, they're the right person. They're the right company. All of these things are sort of checked off, um, but they're not super responsive to their emails, to pick up their phone, leaving voicemails, whatever that may be. Um, how many times do you keep checking in with them? Do you vary the ways that you check in with them? What's sort of the, the follow-up basics, best practices? I, I think the, and I might channel my inner Steli for this one. I'm not going to do his, I'm, I'm, I won't try and do his voice, but I, I think there's no right number because there, there's no, it, there, there's no magic number. There's no, oh, you should follow up eight times. And if they don't, if you don't uh, hear from them after eight times, they're garbage They're right? And, and you should ignore them forever. If you've identified that somebody is a potentially a great fit, if I have myself, they are never getting off my list. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to, ver I'll, I'll vary my attempts and, you know, it might give them a rest and you don't want to hammer them every single day for 365 days a year. But you know, if I, if I drop you a, uh, not the exact same, not an automated email once a week. That's probably on the verge of like, Colin, you're getting annoying. But if it's new, if it's funny, if you're trying to add value and it's not just a template, I put you in a tool and it's going to send you an email once a week, right? Then 
that's the sort of level of like extreme persistence that, that I'm going to apply if I feel like I truly can add value to your company. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with, uh, with Colin's point that there is no magic number. There's no, hey, the, the data's proven that if you just do 7.5 outbound touches, <laughs> then they're gonna talk to you, right? Uh, so I am a big believer, whether right or wrong, because um, this is actually something I've been frustrated by over the years, that there really isn't a clear kind of boilerplate answer. Um, so I've gone under the, the belief that you touch them in a variety of ways, meaning phone, email, um, whether you're leveraging uh, social uh, media tools and so on, uh, but you touch them a variety of times in a short period of time, meaning over a two week period, let's say, and if they don't respond to you or engage with you, then it's best to put them back into a marketing drip campaign and keep that engagement there via marketing. Uh, but then for whatever reason, they were a lead. Maybe they just got really busy. They just got a new project. Their priorities have changed. Uh, so if they're not going to engage you, then it's, it's just like outbound where maybe this just isn't the right time. Uh, but to Colin's point as well, in those touches over, over a shorter period of time, um, you have to be creative. You have to send a piece of content that could be interesting to them uh, and not ask them for anything in return, right? Then you send them something funny. You take a relevant article uh, that, that you just read this morning that, that's related to their industry and you shoot that over to them. Uh, you, you have to be creative in what those touches are. I actually, <clears throat> I, I'll, I'll put touch on the other part of the question is like how, right? Like how many times, but also how do you differ the touch points. So I have literally flown to conferences and walked by bathroom 20 times because I know a speaker who's a, who could be a really good fit is going to be speaking and will have to go to the restroom before they go on stage. So <clears throat> like, I believe in that kind of persistence and I've closed deals because of that. Um, I believe in that kind of persistence. I don't know if like I 100% believe in like, hey, keep them in the CRM for forever. Um, I think somebody in the chat mentioned about CRM hygiene. I think, think <clears throat> there, is a, there is a balance there, but I agree that it depends on, you know, if you're closing, like, you know, if it's a $2 million deal uh, and if that's your average deal size, then there is a, you know, there's a lot you can do. But if it's like, you know, a, a, you know, a thousand dollar deal, then, you know, then you're, then you're stuck. I'm curious what your opener was when you met the guy standing next to him in the urinal. <laughs> Oh, uh, <laughs> hi, uh, you belong to that company. Such and such has invested in us, who is also like your, like this CEO had invested in us a yeah. long, long time ago. And like, oh, I know your CEO because like, I, blah, blah, blah. And they were like, oh, okay. And then it was like, you know, it was a three minute conversation, but I got a phone call, I got a meeting. Hope I you washed your heads first. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I was, uh, yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> Uh, all right, guys. We got we got another question here from Julie. That was a good one. Uh, what kinds of cats, sorry, Ryan? We're just <laughs> thinking out of the bathroom here. Um, what kinds of tactics can you guys use um, to get decision makers in on the conversation when you know you're talking to a non-stakeholder? And and let's say you know you've made the soft ask of like, hey, is there anyone else that should be a part of this conversation? Um, but it, it's just not really going anywhere. Mm -hmm. I. I, um, I know we're like in the book, big fans of, of sort of top down, top down. So preference is always, if you can go in high, that's the, that's the best place to start. Um, I was interviewing my buddy, Phil Keen. Um, he was over at, um, and and Costello, I think is the, or Costello is the name. Um, I, I think he's, he's somewhere else now, but he's part of AISP in, in, in Indy. Anyway, he was talking about top down, bottoms up. So if you can't go tops down, top down, go bottoms up and he'll go wide in the organization. So let's say he's selling to a VP of sales, right? And he can't get in touch with that VP of sales. He's gonna go talk to, try and talk to every single member on that VP sales team and try and, and not sell to the sales team, but try and understand what their pains, what their challenges. And what he's looking for is some data, some insight, something that he can pull on that the, that the VP of sales might not be aware of that he can tie to his product selling so that when he's going back to try and re-engage that VP, hey, I've got this little nugget that I've learned. It's not just, you know, you can leverage your champions and you can do all that and that's certainly helpful, but I feel like the, the real way to get 
more senior people on the in the conversation is to to do your research, show them the value. I like that. So guys, we, we've got about five minutes left. Um, we're gonna try and get through as many more of these questions as we can. Um, here's one that came up a few times as well. Um, for deals that are moving slowly for one reason or another, how do you drive more urgency or speed it up toward a close? Cattle prod. Mike? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's definitely one way. Um, yeah, to me, if the engagement, so, so there's a, a tool you can use called a sequence of events. And so you're engaged with the buyer, you're going through the evaluation process. Um, it's literally a, a, another living document, but it's just a simple Google sheet or spreadsheet or whatever that outlines, hey, you told me that you want to have this implemented by September 1. So let's just back away from that date and all of the key uh, events that have to happen and there's things on my end as the salesperson or the, the vendor uh, that I have to do between now and then. There's things that you, the buyer, has to do between now and then. Um, but I, I will tell you, if, if somebody goes really silent on you for a period of, of several weeks and, and you've continued to reach out to them, uh, then, then my contention is there probably isn't enough value or the priority at this time for them to want to continue to engage with you. Um, so I'm a big believer in sending a very polite uh, uh, email that in essence says, hey, it's my fault. I think I might have missed the key requirements. Here's what you told me you, you were trying to accomplish. Here's what we discussed the solution would be. I've obviously missed the, 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 your priorities and I apologize for that. My suggestion at this point is that uh, we go ahead and walk away from this engagement together and let's revisit this at a time that makes sense for you. Um, I can tell you one of the largest deals at, in, in full context history that we got done uh, was that email being sent and them responding right away when they were silent after like five weeks of an engagement, responding back right away, we got the contract signed three weeks later. Um, because they, there really was value for them and they didn't want us to walk away. Many times you send out that email and they don't respond to you. Well, okay, don't, you shouldn't be wasting your time as a sales rep following up and following up because uh, obviously their priorities have changed or you didn't build the value or whatever the case. I think one thing not to do <clears throat> is to get into that. If you, if you sign before the end of the quarter, we'll give you 20% off. Right? Like, that's, uh, that's like kind of the default. That a lot of sales people try to do, I would, I would steer, I would steer here, especially in enterprise sales. Yeah. If they're not, and just to build on what Mike said, I, I love that approach. Um, if they go silent on that, and you're looking for one other tactic, uh, one of my favorites, um, not my line. Like this came, I'm stealing this from Chris Voss. Never split the difference. Is have you given up on this project? Simple line, it's and you, you either you either get a yes, and it's like great. When should I re-engage? Next quarter, next year, et cetera? Or you get a no, here's the explanation why, let's re-engage at this point. I, I've had that reactivate so many deals for me, it's, it's almost like cheating. All right, guys, this is our last question. This one's from Lynette. We've got a couple minutes left. Um, what's the best way to start experimenting with outbound if you don't have a dedicated salesperson um, or personal expertise at it? Can I take this one? Don't go for it. <laughs> Don't. There, really? You can't. You, you can't experiment unless you got somebody who's full time dedicated to it. Because here's here's the thing. You, you're going to get some people that are. I see. Prag disagrees with me. Totally but, disagree with you. <laughs> so so let's 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 see what let's follow the path that most people do. Right. They say, okay, we've got a team of AEs. Right. We have. Um, we want, we read this book, we read this other book. We want to, we want to try outbound. We want to in 30 days, 90 days, we want to see what we can get. Right. So they take somebody junior on the team. They say, read this book and go send some emails. Right. You're putting your lowest, uh, trained experienced person on this thing that could be potentially game changer for your organization. The number of companies that I know that we've worked with or companies that have just read the book and told me about their success that have started off as 100% of the revenue is from inbound and now they're doing tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars 
um, in the case of Acquia, where Acquia started off with, I think they were around 10 million when they first started doing outbound. Now they're doing well over 100 million. And I want to say 97% of their business roughly comes from outbound versus inbound. So when you think about something that potentially could be, could take up 90 or could make up 97% of your future revenue, you're going to outsource that on the side of the, either to somebody else who, you know, may or may not know what they're doing and, or you're going to give it to the lowest level person in your organization and say, you know, Hey, give this a chance. That's the mistake that I see a lot of people make. And they say, Oh, we tried outbound and it didn't work. It's like, well, you had somebody low, low in the organization that didn't really understand that didn't have the good list. They didn't have the experience. that didn't have the insights, right? If you really want to jump into this, if you really feel like this is something that can work for my organization, right? And the, the real criteria there are, do you have customers that are worth, you know, 10,000 to hundred, you know, $10,000 or up? Is it B2B? Can you find your customers' emails on the internet, you know, or through a database? Three criteria are hit, right? It's going to work. It's just a matter of it's Calling. getting the right people to make sure that it's a true test and not just uh, somebody off the side of the desk tried it out and it didn't work. Colin, the problem is that you're assuming that inbound is going, to, I mean, you know, when, when, when we first started, like inbound is really hard to take off and it's it, it almost impossible to scale, right? Because you need a ton of brand presence, you need PR, but a small startup, like especially like startup not in Silicon Valley that have not raised a ton of money, is that's that kind of stuff is really hard. So the only option, like, yes, ideally, you make a splash and like you have a ton of inbound from day one. That's not going to happen. So for a lot of founders, the only option they have is outbound. And I, I hundred percent like I, I agree with you that like a, a junior <clears throat> intern cannot do your outbound. The CEO, the founder has to start <clears throat> the process. But I, I totally disagree with you to not do outbound. I think that should be the first thing that a founder needs to do once they're ready to sell is start sending personalized messages to your buyers. Uh, uh, start finding that contact because inbound, it'll take years before it's going to take off if it ever does. Um, and it another several years before it brings the right people in. Um, so I, th I think it's a luxury. Uh, inbound is a luxury that few people can afford. And we kind of, you know, being venture back companies, we kind of forget that from time to time. Yeah, and I'll just clarify, Ryan. I know you're trying to keep us on time here. I, I wasn't saying don't do. I wasn't saying don't do inbound. If you're a solo founder or if you're like a new company, absolutely agree with you. You have to be doing outbound, and specifically, I'd probably be doing it through LinkedIn because that's going to be your sort of your quickest to value, your lowest cost. Blah 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 blah. Give LinkedIn some money. Don't worry about the rest of things. That's a great way to start. Highly recommend that. That's what I did to start my crappy CRM business that failed. Um, the carburetor thing that we ended up merging with predictable revenue. That's how we got everything off the ground. Absolutely. hundred percent agree. The question I heard was, you know, how do we dip our toes into outbound? How do we try? How do we experiment? And my comment there is there's really no dipping your toes in. You have to fully commit. You have to have somebody who's full, who's full time. And the hundred percent of their main role is to be, is to be hundred percent accountable for making this successful, right? If you're the CEO, right? And you're trying to find, you've got your first 10, you're trying to get the next hundred customers. That's really the only thing that matters, right? The branding, the, this, the, that, like where you, where you work out of, nothing else matters until you're getting that, until you're seeing that customer growth. So if that's the role that you're in, then yes, as the CEO, your hundred percent full-time accountability needs to be driving outbound. Well, and why does all it, in. In, my, in my opinion, it doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to be full-time. You do it three hours a day, two hours a day, be very organized around it. You can like I am a testament to the fact. That I can you tell can't we're not going to get ground. Ground here. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Just I, just I look at the number. Of, look at the number of salespeople. Exactly done. Um, if you want to keep the conversation going, though, uh, we're going to be sending out a recording of this. Um, so keep it going in the comments after we send out the recording. But you guys, thank you all for joining us. Uh, take care. We'll see you again soon. Right on. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thanks for having. Thanks, Ryan. See ya. Nice to meet you, Josh. Prague. Good to see you again, Mike. Good to see you, bud. All right. Take it easy, guys.